Um, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to um, this bright and early panel on Exile Media and Investigative Toolkit. Uh, my name is Charlotte Alfred. I'm an editor at Lighthouse Reports. We're an investigative newsroom um, that brings together cross-border collaborations that combine um, in, in innovative investigative reporting methods. Um, the project that I run at Lighthouse Reports is called War Winners. Um, we work in partnership with investigative journalists and investigative newsrooms in exile to uh, report on the corruption, profiteering, and exploitation in conflict and post-conflict zones. Um, and it's really my pleasure to um, moderate uh, this panel today with um, three really interesting journalists whose organizations are um, in different ways um, really testing what it means to be an investigative reporting organization in exile. Um, before I introduce them, um, two quick things. One, we're actually not going to do presentations today. This is going to be much more of a kind of informal discussion. Um, so um, we, we're going to sort of have a discussion between ourselves. Um, I have some questions for you. I hope you'll also, uh, you know, ask questions of each other and, and feedback. This doesn't have to be so formal. Um, and then we'll turn over to the audience to have kind of an open discussion. I'm sure there are people in here who um, also have uh, tools or experiences that are, are, are worth sharing. Um, but we also, the panel wanted to just start um, by uh, paying our respects to um, many of us know um, or have worked with journalists who have been arrested or disappeared and killed. Um, and we just wanted to acknowledge that fact. Um, we also wanted to express our solidarity to many of our colleagues um, in Exiled Media who um, weren't able to be here because of visa restrictions. Um, so there's a large part of our community who, who's not able to participate in person. Um, and uh, they're an important part of these discussions. Um, so with that, um, I, will, I will turn over to um, our three wonderful panelists. I'm going to let you introduce yourselves um, and tell us a little bit about the sort of history of your, your media organization, um, how it came about, why it came about, um, and how it's, how it's set up. I think we have three quite different organizations in the room, so it's an it's interesting um, combination of perspectives. Um, and I think also talk to us a little bit about the context um, within, which you're, within which you're working. Um, why is there an exiled media presence in your country? What is the situation there? Um, and you know, how big is the exiled media space? Um, so I think we'll start with you. Carlos, uh, tell us about you and Alfaro. Gracias, um, uh, Charlotte. Uh, good morning. Thank you for coming after yesterday's big party. I think it's a whole achievement. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to try to be very brief about Alfaro. We turned 25 years old this year. We were the first online media in uh, Latin America, 1998. Um, but the important thing about that is that um, it means we were born in democracy. Uh, the peace agreements were signed in El Salvador in 1992, and we were one of the first post-war media, which means um, I'm part of the first generation that uh, learned the ropes in democracy and freedom. Um, there's a couple of other generations that has uh, grown up in the same conditions, and that's what's being dismantled in my country and in Central America in general. Um, right now we are facing uh, the worst situation for journalists in the region since the end of the Cold War. Um, particularly the case of Nicaragua is alarming more than uh, most of uh, independent journalism is um, being practiced in exile, mostly from Costa Rica, but also from Mexico and other places. Um, and uh, Honduras remains, um, with Mexico, the two most dangerous countries in Latin America uh, uh, for journalists because of the homicide rate. They are being killed. Um, in Guatemala, with the political crisis, um, 
we have already dozens of journalists in exile. Um, and the most prominent Guatemalan journalist, Jose Rubén Zamora, um, has already been in prison for the last eight months. Um, just to tell you how grave it is, um, around in 2018, we held a panel like this in Nicaragua. Um, I was in the panel with two other journalists, Jose Rubén Zamora and Carlos Fernando Chamorro from Nicaragua. Uh, we held this panel in Managua right now. Jose Rubén Zamora is in prison, as I said, accused of money laundering. Carlos Fernando Chamorro is in exile, accused um, of money laundering. Um, and I have also been accused of money laundering by President Bukele um, from El Salvador. So what I mean is in a very short amount of time, in a relatively short amount of time, we have been forced to adapt ourselves to practice journalism in a way that we never knew. Um, uh, in, an, in a constant emergency mode um, and with special procedures uh, to take journalists out uh, to see where we will receive them and how uh, can we keep practicing journalism from outside. Now, the good news is um, I believe that never in the history of, of the region we have seen better journalism than what is being practiced today. It's amazing the, the quality, the level of journalism and the commitment of my colleagues all, um, all throughout the region. And I believe that also never before uh, we have been in such an intense dialogue between colleagues from different countries, um, getting together to find solutions um, um, and to go ahead um, together we have realized this makes us stronger and we and better organized, we are better prepared to face all, all the attacks that we are going through and will stop them. Thank you, Carlos. Um, Mahtab, tell us a little bit about Zamana. Good morning, my name is Mahtab and I'm working for Zamana Media. Um, Zamana Media was founded like 2006 or 2007, I guess, and until 2017, we used to be a radio Right now we are a website and also we are have a platform for podcasts. So our main focus region is Iran and we are just reporting on Iran. Uh, we are doing lots of investigative journalism, also reporting on the women issue, labor issue, and minorities. About the situation in Iran, so I, I want to mention the mm, latest ranking of reporters without borders that among 180 country, uh, Iran has a ranking of 177. So you can imagine that, you know, what's going on. And um, right now, as of September, like mid-September this year, 79 journalists are in prison. And most of them has been um, arrested during the time of the Mahsa revolution. I have to mention that the Mahsa revolution, which you probably you know as a, a women liberty, uh, li uh, women life freedom, uh, actually started with two female journalists inside Iran, and you know they were just uh, they were the people who were breaking the news that a woman has died, has been killed during the police custody. So uh, we have about, you know, we have a huge community of Iranian outside Iran, about like, a, we don't have the exact number, between seven and, uh, between five and seven million Iranian living in, as an expat or in exile. Um, and 80 million people are inside Iran. The situation of the press is just really horrible. As I mentioned, you know, a couple of indications, you can just find tons of stories about what's going on. Um, so. You know, we are here. <laughs> we should just uh, carry the torch and keep the candle alive. Matab, was Samana set up in exile, or you were originally based inside Iran and had to no, move no, it, out? No, it started in. Uh, well, we are based in Amsterdam. Did I say that? No. So we are based in Amsterdam, and yeah, it started in exile. Okay, and it's been going for a long time now. Yeah. So you're time. very established. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mohammed. Tell us about Sirad. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, Siraj is uh, a non-profit organization also in uh, 
established in 2016 in the Excite. Uh, we have a story behind the Siraj establishment. We think in Syria we don't have accountability. Uh, and we think as a journalist, uh, we have to seek for enforcement this this vocabulary, at least in, in Syria. Syria is a country uh, not open, Assad hates journalists as any dictator in this world. And we think, as a journalist also, we were in Syria and now living in exile. Uh, accountability, if we have an accountability, we will not arrive to this situation now in, in Syria after 10 years or 12 years of, of, of war. And uh, after revolution, the situation for journalists inside Syria was very, very tough to continue working. So we went out, started working from ab abroad to covering the, the what's happening on, on the ground as independent journalists. So we make like a collective of uh, collaboration between many very good Syrian journalists living abroad to make this kind of an umbrella for all investigative work, for investigative journalists also. And we found that we have one goal, one aim to, to make the culture of investigation in Syria and the dictator. It's like a battle against the dictatorship, actually. We believe in democracy, but we don't have any ways to, to, to believe in, in, in democracy community. We, yeah, so we think in journalism we can do some kind of fight, maybe, some kind of resistance against this kind of restriction against journalism. So, and the, yeah, uh, after that we, we found that we can do something very important against this kind of a propaganda, which is living uh, since 50 years in, in, in Syria. After that, we started to find that our investigation is very good, very high demanded also from international media and our partner in region. And uh, we started to make great collaboration with, with international media in Europe and around the world. And we found that we have some impact. It's not huge, but it's at least we, 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 we can say, raise a flag that we have some independent media, some great investigation try to make change in the community, yeah. Uh, beside of that, we start to thinking about the change inside the country because uh, if you still living outside and your colleagues still inside the country, you have to make some uh, measure of risks and do some broad inside policy, like internal policy inside the organization to put moving further to achieve your goals. Uh, the, investigation uh, unit net, network for investigation. Uh, most of you knows about the journalism situation in Syria as uh, any countries in the Middle East and uh, in the East. Uh, Syria, it's not, as I said, it's not like uh, a country of journalism. It's close country, black country on the list of freedom of journalism. And uh, in the war, we lost so many friends and colleagues in the ground. They died, and we respect their work because they fight, and they stand, stand in the front of the lines to, to, to transfer information and to tell the, 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 the world what's happening on the ground. Now the situation, unfortunately, became more dangerous. Now we have Russian invention in Syria, and... Uh, other countries help Assad to be in the power. And it's not a good situation for journalism to work also. Now Syria, it's like a black country. It's like a wall everywhere. If you want to get information, to seek for transparency, for, yes, freedom of transferring the information. But always as a journalist, living in exile, and we have a team inside the country trying to raising our capacity, raising our, raising our skills also, training daily to, 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 to keep going, you can say in this uh, way. And to say, yes, we have a good example for media and exile, still living uh, outside the country, but they gave like 
very pure journalism. And that's what we, we're looking for to, to stay in that. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, is, is there another microphone for the panelist? There's, we already have two. Only one. Um, are you all non profit? Yeah. Now, we are. now you are non profit. This, this has changed since you had to. Uh, yes. Um, we were a for profit without profit for many years. <laughs> <laughs> That's very familiar in this, uh, um, in this conference, yeah. And due to the uh, pressure from the Salvadoran government, we moved last year. Um, uh, we changed um, ownership from a private company in El Salvador to a foundation that we established in Costa Rica to get off uh, the reach of uh, the government. So now we are a non-profit, still without profit. Yeah, <laughs> again, familiar. <No> profit. <laughs> Mahtab, you were yes, a and always been a non-profit, yes. and also Suraj as well. I think it's interesting, you know, when we talk about Exile Media, you know, it's a really varied um, group of organizations, and you can see that in this room. Um, El Faro, you know, having a, a long tradition inside the country and then having to kind of adapt a business model and a way of operating um, in a crisis situation. Zamana, uh, being founded in exile, but being, you know, a long-term um, both Zamana and El Faro being a platform that, um, you know, provides a, uh, you know, you provide daily news as well as investigations, um, uh, features a, a combination of news. Uh, Suraj, a much younger organization, um, also founded in exile, quite, still quite small, um, but working in a different way. You're not a platform for Syrian news. Um, you are trying to develop Syrian journalism by you know, training and supporting investigations, much more of a kind of uh, um, a connector and a capacity enhancer. Um, so I think that's kind of worth mentioning. I mean, to put in context, you've all mentioned the specific situations in your countries and kind of how things have got, got worse or just been consistently bad. Sorry, Mahatab. Um, uh, but the, the global situation is getting worse. There's it's a very imprecise science to look at the size of the exile media space, but the sort of best efforts out there. About 10, 12 years ago, there was a report by the Center for International Media Assistance, um, which is part of NED in the US, and the author was looking at the global space, and he estimated there were about 50 really like strong exile media organizations that had you know around 10 to more staff um, around the world. Um, more recently, um, a scholar uh, in Brussels um, has been doing a kind of survey of exiled media, um, and he his survey so far has found 100 exiled media organizations in, around the world. So um, even in the space of, of that decade, this is you know a growing um, number of organizations. You will face, I'm sure, very different challenges because of your different organizations, but there are also some things that are really in parallel here, um, and that's... Um, what I'd like to get into next. Um, so uh, it's important, I think, the first place that uh, we have to start is about safety. Um, it's, you know, the top of mind um, for, for all of you, I know. Um, Carlos, I was wondering if you could talk us through a little bit how, how you've been thinking about that in this kind of crisis period that you've been through, adapting to being partly outside the country and inside the country, if there are organizations that are facing the prospect of having to leave their country or they have very recently left, where should they start? What, what would your advice to them be? Um, even though this is a very fast process of the dismantling of democracy in Central America, um, things don't happen um, in a minute. It's, it's a process of this decomposition. And uh, you have, it, it has, pushed us to reflect seriously on, on, on the real basis of, of journalism. Let me try to give you an example. Um, in a democracy, um, what, what people call independent media, and I just call journalism, is expected to uh, talk truth to power, to be in a position to criticize power. That's what people expect from, from, from journalism, no matter who is uh, administrating the state. But when we 
when the regime is, is when the government is mutating to an autocratic regime, everything changes. It's very polarizing. Um, and in this polarization, both sides um, expect something different from you. They expect you to take sides. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, um, to keep practicing journalism in such a huge uh, pressure from both sides. You're either a friend or a foe. You're not a, you're not seen, they are not expecting you to do journalism anymore. They expect you to do activism in favor of one of the sides. Um, and when the people in power that control all the institutions of the state, declare you a public enemy, it's very tempting to take sides. Um, because they are tying you up, they're attacking you, they are not allowing you to, um, um, to, to, to do what we do. Um, and of, of course you are fighting against them but when you say something about the other side, the other side gets angry because they, 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 they see you as a traitor. How come he was one of us? No, I was not one of you. Um, the other thing that changes a lot is that, for example, we have three years uh, uh, talking about our situation. We became the story, mm. which is not natural for journalists. We are not the story. We tell other people's stories. We tell other stories. We tell the story of the play, our communities. We become the story. And I believe that when this happens, um, that battle, they have won. Because we invest so much time and resources thinking um, about how to put you, our story, how to compete in terms of narrative. We invest so much, so many resources in defending ourselves. We have many legal cases opened against us. We have invested so much time on this. I have talked to more lawyers in the last three years than in the previous 40 something years of my life. Mm. I never met so many lawyers ever. Now, <laughs> I, I am at risk of becoming one of them. Mm. Um, uh, these has uh, sought so many resources that should be put uh, to investigate people in power. So in that way, I think they are winning this battle. And then we can go uh, step by step on all the other things that change when, when, when this starts to happen. I mean, I believe that the main difference between our situation and Mahtab and Mohammed is that we are in transition to that place. They are already there. Uh, we are in a transition. Um, this has an emotional um, cost for the people in the organization um, uh, while we adapt to this. Um, uh, of course, we can talk at length, if any of you want, about what happens with sources. How do you keep managing access to information when you are not in the country anymore? Um, when all the access to information has been closed by the, per the persons who rule the state. Um, we can talk about money. In our case, um, all our commercial income completely disappeared. It's very natural. Who wants to get in trouble um, with an autocrat just because they want to have an ad at El Faro? No businessman wants to do that. It's crazy. So we don't have any more commercial income. So, in, in, in few words, our income completely decreased and our expenses went this high. Uh, moving to Costa Rica was very expensive. Paying lawyers was very expensive. Taking people out of the country is very expensive. Um, so, our, our expenses grew a lot and our income completely disappeared, our commercial income, um, which is, of course, a big part of the problem. Um, media more established in exile, like for example our Nicaraguan colleagues, what they do now is that they operate from exile, but they still have some people inside, which f for me are heroes, because they are completely anonymous. And you know, putting your name on a story is so such an important thing for journalists. 
They are completely anonymous. That's the only way they can still get access to people or to information. Um, um, and that's the only way that the, uh, the media can operate from, from exile. Um, I th the Nicaraguans are for us, uh, we call them our door to the future. We see what they are doing because we're going there at a, f at a, at a very fast pace. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave it there and then ask, uh, answer any questions. Um, Mohammed, do you want to talk about, and I'm aware that when we talk about security in a public forum, sometimes we don't want, really want to go into the details. Um, we will have a, a networking session today at uh, 1.45 in the Congress Hall. If you want to kind of get into some of the specifics of some of these questions, please do come along to that. I think it's might be easier to do so um, in a one-to-one in -a -one basis and you can, you know, pick the panelist's brain or also there's a a lot of organizations here who have a lot of experience in this. Um, so as much or as little as you want to say, Mohammed, as uh, Carlos was mentioning with the Nicaraguan um, media organizations there, uh, have colleagues inside and outside. How, how do you manage that from Suraj's point of view? You have colleagues inside Syria. Yes. Uh, actually, the situation in Syria is not different too much uh, than other country like uh, America and Latin. Uh, I just want to say with just one thing, with every war around the world, we will have an exiled media. With every pairs of dictatorship and dictator country, we will have another exiled media. I don't think it's good or not, but uh, it's a situation now in the world. Uh, when we started Siraj, uh, we think a lot about that. We thought a lot about the safety because the situation of danger in Syria is different and has different level from up to to, to, to down. Uh, we have a risk uh, on journalists. We have a risk on, on sources. We have a risk uh, coming from militia, from any side. So we have to be uh, careful every step on the process of, of uh, uh, investigation. When we started to, to, to investigate about specific issues, we asked for help from uh, friends, from other uh, organization, colleagues, like uh, in the region, in the Arab countries, which is, has like independent media, like Daraj in Lebanon. Our, uh, we have a strategic partnership in different level with them, so they afford some consultancies mm. for our journalists, for our staff on the ground and outside also. Uh, technology afforded some tools for us to, to evade the censorship. Technology helps us inside of open source also to getting more information from the country as much as we can. Uh, yeah, it's it's it, it's like a zigzag way we have to walk on. And inside the, the organization, we have like a clear policy about the major risk on the stories. Sometimes when when we have some idea or some journalist leaks papers or documents for us, we have like policy how we can handle with the story, how we can get the story to the table of editors also. For example, we have like a, a, a a measure from one to 10, and we decide in the editorial room if it's the major more than seven, that way we kill a story. We don't take it for many reasons. I think this kind of work help us to evade too, too, too much risk also. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's like a tax you have to pay, even if it's a good story and was to be in international newsroom, uh, but we can handle this kind of, of uh, risk. And we tried also our journalists on the ground to, to, to we help them to understand this mechanism of work inside the organization because they think he has like or she has great story, great hypothesis, need to worse the story, but he's, he has good, good ambitions, I, I mean, but he doesn't don't understand, it doesn't understand it's it's uh, has like risk and need to be mm. slowed down. Uh, and if we publish it, you because they are in the uh, start career middle and they need to understand the situation better. So we have to 
make them understand the situation of risk also mm. better. And uh, I think it's addition mission for us, additional mission for us to make them understand the risk beside of the story. Mm. That's a really good point. You're working with, you know, if you're working with experienced journalists, experienced in operating in that, that setting, it's quite different to young journalists in a country yeah. where there isn't a strong tradition of investigative journalism. You're trying to start a tradition and a, and a culture of investigative journalism. Yeah. There's a lot of responsibility to, to the journalists that are starting out with you. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we have, for example, a student at the university think he should start investigation from uh, Assad until uh, pollution and water. So they have good amb uh, ambitions to, to work in the investigation, but we, we have to learn them and teach them how they move step by step until mm. publication. Mm. A good parallel, I think, as well with what Carlos was saying. You know, Carlos, you were talking about learning from your Nicaraguan colleagues and, and you with the partnership with Daraj and Lebanon. It's like, don't think that you just have to start from completely scratch. <laughs> like, there are, there are others out there who have, like, been thinking through these problems and, and um, can help. I, I wanted to ask um, Mohammed and the rest of the panel, please weigh in. Um, safety is not just about physical safety. There's also psychological safety. You, you mentioned the kind of emotional toll of, of exile. How, in your newsrooms, how are you thinking about the, the psychological safety of your colleagues, this type of investigative journalism, and the, the fact of being in exile takes a severe toll on, on you and, and your staff. How, how, do you, how do you manage that within your organization? Yeah, uh, I think by the end of the day, we are human. We affected also by publishing and by t by being in, in in touch with the problem everywhere uh, and different level of of problems and uh, sources. Uh, so we affected by the way uh, in in this way. But we saw we we saw that in 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 the international level of helping the organization that they afford some consultancy to avoid the problem health, uh, mental health problem and psychological. Uh, problems. But in, uh, after that, after two, three years of working with the journalist, we get much better understanding about these uh, issues inside rooms. So in the annual budget, it is like practical uh, example, uh, and I uh, recommend it to implement this in, in, in the organization. You should, in your annual budget, to get like a uh, budget line for this kind of services. You have to pay for experts, for mental treatment, to help your journalists to face this critical situation in the mental health. Because if you want to attend the Zoom session with the X organization, which is help in mental health treatment, I think it, 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 it's, it's okay to get some consultancies to, to treat with the situation, but if you uh, let your journalist or your colleague in the newsroom dealing directly with experts or with uh, medicine, maybe, to, to have some consultancy directly. And uh, I, I think it's more useful than to be in the session and talking about, about mental health. Right. One, yeah. one workshop on trauma is not going to yes. solve the problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, you had said something, I think, really nice earlier, which was, I have to take care of this because if we're not taking care of, of my mental health and, and my team, then there will be no investigative journalism. Exactly. Like if we are not able to work, then we won't be able to do yes, the journalism. Yeah. It's a very crucial issue also to be on the table always to, to, to discuss. Um, Carlos, on that, but also on just, so the practicalities of running a newsroom, your, uh, some of your colleagues are in exile, a lot are in, still in the country. You know, what, what do you do about uh, creating a sense of we're still a team? Um, how do you manage the operational side? Talk us through kind of what, what you've been through to set up some processes that, that work in that context. Um, we thank COVID. <laughs> okay. Because uh, the pandemic uh, uh, was a great exercise to learn how to work remotely. So when this became more intense, we were already used to work remotely. So everything was easier. Really, uh, uh, the pandemics ended up being 
um, um, a good training uh, uh, period for us. Um, so since then, I mean, we have been taking journalists in and out. In El Salvador, we, we have a year and a half under um, a regime of exception, which means uh, basically all our rights are suppressed and police can arrest you without any judicial warrant. Um, they passed a law, Congress passed a law um, um, that uh, considers prison terms for journalists, publishers that publish anything that has to do with gangs. Um, people call it the El Faro law because we've been publishing about uh, President Bukele's negotiations with the gangs for a long time. Um, um, but that didn't deter us from investigating or publishing stories about the, the government's deals with the gangs. So every time a journalist publishes something, we need to take him out of the country and he doesn't know when he's going to go back. Um, yes, of course, this has an emotional toll. Um, um, I have to say there's also a gender element in here. When I received, for example, a death threat or a big lynching um, on media, um, my colleagues, uh, my female colleagues, also received those threats. But the, they also received uh, sexual threats that I don't. Um, they are also more vulnerable in a society that is basically ruled uh, with this uh, uh, not very uh, equal culture uh, in, in gender terms. So when they get home, their family reacts differently, demands different things from them. Uh, they are subject to a much bigger amount of pressure than what we do. Um, so it's, it's, as a director, I. I need to be aware of all these things and try to deal with them. I don't always know how to do this because I'm not a psychologist, I'm not an, I'm a reporter that just happens to be directing uh, the media. Um, and I have to learn and I think that the best way for me to do that is to talk to, to, to everyone and, and listen to them and try to understand what they're going through because it's, it's different from for everybody. Um, it's. Everybody has a different experience, so each one. So when you have to leave the country, um, what Simone Weil called unrootedness, you are taken mm -hmm. out of your roots. Um, and this may become a personal drama for some people. Um, we talk a lot, we meet a lot, we get together a lot through Zoom, since we can do it personally. Um, uh, or through some safe ways, because now we have also had to develop uh, a safe ways to communicate between ourselves um, in order to avoid the, the, the state surveillance. Um, I spoke at length in the inaugural session about Pegasus and electronic surveillance. If anyone, if any of you was there, I'm going to spare you from repeating the story, but this has implied uh, taking special measures also to communicate among ourselves, to communicate with our sources, and to coordinate um, um, the job. Because at the end of the day, um, I, every week I tell my team, no one obliges you to keep doing this. But know what are the consequences of your decision if you keep doing this, right? That's your decision. I am... Um, you are completely entitled to stop doing this. And for some people it works to live for some time. Um, um, to take up something else to do for three months, to leave the country for three months. There are certain programs in Europe, for example, in other Latin American places in the United States where they can go for three months, relax, breathe, and think if they want to come back to the same situation. Some come back. Some don't, and they are completely entitled to do that. But if they stay, they need to keep working because we are, we are journalists. That's what we do. The the types of um, programs you're talking about, it's like the scholarships and fellowships for like rest. Uh, it's kind of yeah. Um, uh, I know there are some in Europe as well, um, and some in the US. It's a good thing to mention. Um, Mohammed, you had said something similar to me yesterday about sort of I'm a journalist, then I had to 
quickly become a manager. Um, yeah. Suraj has, you know, turned from a quite small organization has started to grow. How has that process been for you? What have you learned? Yeah, it's, it, it's like a process of learning. Started with a journalist and became a manager. And uh, you have to learn some tools related to managing your newsroom. How do you learn those tools? Uh, yes, it's, <laughs> it's hard to tell. It's like self-work, uh, daily work, learning, watching, uh, and uh, attending some courses, paid sometimes, sometimes free, asking for consultancies from uh, older manager or has more experience than us, how we can deal with this critical, for example, if you have some problems and uh, you face some challenges with managing, so I can ask. Uh, like a mentor. Yeah, so 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 it's like, uh, as, as I said, this process of learning. Mm. And uh, yeah, we have to do that. Mm. Yeah. Turning back to the journalism, Mahtab, um, so reporting in exile brings its own challenges. Some Carlos had already mentioned, you know, the difficulty of cultivating sources when you're outside the country, not to mention whether you have a Pegasus sort of uh, infection sort of looming over you and, and building that sort of trust with sources and, and how hard that can be. What are some of the ways that that you and Zamana um, do journalism from exile that, that would be different if you, you know, you had more access in the country? Well, uh, before answering that question, I want to uh, add something. Um, Carlos mentioned about that if you are one of the challenges when you are reporting in exile, uh, there are lots of emotions going on. There is a movement, there is brutality of police, there is a widespread, and you know, like just in a matter of a week, 1,000 people are being killed, and you can see all of those videos. And it's not like that you are watching, for example, the brutality of the police in Washington, D.C., or New York. It's the place that, you know, some of the people, some of those pictures are your friends. And then there are your ex-colleagues, they are reporting, and then they are just being uh, arrested. So lots of emotions going on. And the main challenge is that, yeah, all of the, those are on place, but at the end of the day, you are a reporter and you have to keep your calm and uh, being as much as possible fair. I think that's the biggest challenge. And then there are other things coming, you know, like just, um, um, I, I just want to mention to the community that when we see a journalist in exile, it's not just that that person is an expat and is just coming, you know, grabbing his suitcase, coming and say, okay, let's leave and, you know, like just work in Amsterdam. It has lots of beautiful canals and yeah, <laughs> just gonna work there. No, it's not like that. In that suitcase, you have all the traumas of a revolution or the war, you know, like just the lost friend, the people are in prison. So you have to deal with all of those at the same time. However, you know, I think that every journalist and every organization should have some kind of support group and, you know, like just taking care of that. However, you know, we have lots of journalists here and I want to tell them that as a community, we should be aware that, you know, like a journalist in exile is not an expat, it's something else. Uh, especially when it's come to deadline. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, uh, what else I wanted to say? Oh, about the challenges. So, the challenges, I cannot give you a formula that, yeah, you know, like just you can have this kind of VPN, you know, or that kind of tool, and the problem going to be solved. As long as we are just having progress in finding new ways, there are not a bunch of idiots on the other side. They're coming with new ways to block the internet, to block the access and everything. So it's just like you're walking in the jungle, and you know, it's just like there are lots of trees, and you know, like a lion coming, and all of those wild animals. So you should be creative. Sometimes you have to jump up the tree, sometimes you have to run away, sometimes you have to fight back. So. The only thing is I can say there is no formula. You should be creative and you can really find a way that how to find the source, how you can just do it on the spot. And uh, well, however, we have tons of help, uh, uh, you know, as uh, Carlos mentioned, the anonymous reporters inside Iran, they are just putting themselves in danger. 
they're just giving us information. There are some hackers that, you know, which is a little bit tricky to process. And uh, actually, there was a very good session yesterday here in the conference. And uh, then there are other tools. So, um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think you, you answered it. It's sort of how, yeah, how journalism and how you adapt. And basically, you're saying there's a lot of different ways you've got to adapt. The, um, yeah, I love the analogy of going through the jungle as like investigative <laughs> journalism and exile. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Mohammed. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention to something. I think it's it's like a strategy for evading risk, maybe. Uh, because w we believe in, in collaborative journalism. Uh, because uh, attack on one, it's attack on all. When we create this kind of allies, work on specific stories, so we share risk. And uh, I think it's a very good way to face risk. If we make like a teamwork and a collaborative team on specific stories, so it will be like good idea and good way to, 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 to sharing risk. That's a manner of way to avoid the risk, as I said, and it's, it will complement uh, something related to technology and tools which we have to learn inside our in, in newsroom. And when we started working in, in collaborative way with the partners on specific stories or danger stories, I think it, 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 it makes us learn more the culture of collaborative journalism also in the teamwork. And it's another story also in the long way of work. Of, uh, Can you give an example, example about that, Mohammed? Like Yeah, I, I think recently we published a story about uh, uh, subly ch we, we tracked the subly chain of uh, trading phosphate and uh, uh, sending this kind of material. Uh, it's like fertilizer issues for agriculture. Uh, which is Syria has too much uh, mines of phosphate, and the phosphate is very demanded in Europe, and because it's very quality, ha has very good qualities and is cheap, and Syria has a sanction, and uh, because of sanctions, it's forbidden to, to, to import and make making deals with the Syrian government. Uh, but what I discovered with my colleagues and uh, other newsroom like Lighthouse, Port, and Darad, and other organizations. We tracked this supply chain and we discovered that the, the, the uh, business is going on and uh, some European countries is resuming importing phosphate and benefiting Syrian government and Russian oligarchs which is dominate these mines inside Syria. And uh, after that, we received some threat from militia and head of militia inside the country because all of this, these persons benefit from this trade. And we, say, we found that the EU countries paid to ex and liars, liars of front companies, but by the end of the day, the EU money went to the militia and Russian oligarchs which is extract this phosphate and send it to Europe. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, after that, most of people involved in this trade put on sanction, and uh, the trade may be stopped now. And I, I think without collaboration with international media and the newsroom in Europe and in the Middle East, will not be able to achieve this, this uh, achievement, at least, and publish this kind of cross-border investigation. So I'm happy the example was a story that you and I yeah. worked on together. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, but if you could sort of say, you know, you mentioned that collaboration was useful when you received a threat. So there's the power of numbers. Are there, were there other things that collaboration is, is useful for Siraj? Like, why, why, do you, why do you find these collaborative projects useful? Yeah, uh, I think... Uh, when the Ukrainian war started, the newsroom around the world directly shifted its attention to new crisis in the world, which is like Ukrainian war. But we have another, another <laughs> war behind. It doesn't end. And it became like a second and third priority in the international newsroom. Mm -hmm. So our mission, we think, 
our story was to be tell, always. Not our story, also our your stories, and every journalist has, has a story also. And uh, from that, we believe that we have to, to reach out to the correct persons inside newsrooms to convince them, to pitch them our stories, to work with them. And we found by the end, we, we, we published something. Mm, it's like and raising the, yeah. raising the profile yes, of of exactly. that of the organisation and and of and the uh, work yeah, that you're doing. Also. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you reported that or how some yeah. us some of our it's colleagues? A, uh, yeah, it's a bit like uh, technical uh, issues related to tracking ships. Uh, if we want to mention to the same story, maybe or another story. It's li like uh, fifty percent, for example, related to open sources for example, right. because now we have an access by open sources to so many information. As a journalist, we think it's hard to get, but when we started to learn more about the OSINT and the open sources tools, we discovered that this kind of information is in front of us, but we have to find good way to, to extract this data from many sources in the internet, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and uh, this kind of so many stories related to financial aspects. So we have to go to to corporate registration uh, places and to get hard copies from specific uh, ministries or uh, inside the country and outside. Also, some of them it's paid, so you have to pay. Uh, so from this point, the collaborative work. It's like make the situation, it's easier to get the information in the process of getting more data, more information, and the level of verification, at least mm. in the beginning of the, the I mean, story. No one from your team could go to the, the port in Tartus to track yeah. the ships, yeah. but you have a satellite image. Yeah, and, then, yeah. and you can track the ships. And then one of the things that you're very good at, Mohammed, is... Um, uh, spotting uh, things that people put online by mistake, yeah. <laughs> uh, including the the manifests yes. of the port, um, and then quickly archiving them archiving, uh, yeah. so that they don't get taken down. And then you have this repository of information, which is very helpful when you can't go to yeah. go to places. Um, Mahtab, oh Carlos, you have something to add on that? Yes. Um, Look, I think that here there are some uh, colleagues that are in exile and some others that are uh, going through uh, government changes in their countries that are just coming toward our, our, our same place. Um, I just wanted to say something. Um, um, in this conference, a lot of the uh, colleagues that are uh, practicing journalism from exile are some of the bravest and toughest people that I know. Um, what I mean is... Uh, uh, we don't look ourselves as victims, and this is very important. There's a, a very easy way to stop the attacks against us, and that's quitting and doing something else. Uh, we are here because we, are, we, we want to be here doing this. So, so uh, this victimization narrative, which, which I despise, and uh, it's very uncomfortable, again, to be dedicated to tell our own stories, but I think they need to be told to just to assess what's going on right now and what are the threats um, to journalism. Um, in a big part of the world, journalism is today an act of resistance, of resistance and defense of our freedoms, our freedom of expression, freedom of the press, of human dignity, I would say, and uh, I believe we are committed to that, and I like to see it this way. I'm, I, I mirror myself in the faces of my colleagues that I see in this conference that are so, such amazing people. Uh, and I don't see them as victims, I see them as in, in a much uh, different way. I admire what they do. Uh, now, of course, it's easier to say sometimes and to, than to, to really uh, uh, completely live under these premises. Let me give you a quick example. Um, in my country, the president enjoys, according to the most conservative polls, 87% of popular support. 87% of popular support. He has declared us the public enemy. 
and 87% of the people believe that we are the public enemy, that we are the enemy of the process and of liberation of our people. Um, in other words, we are serving a community that don't believe in us, mm. um, which is basically a, a philosophical dilemma which goes to the roots of what we do. We are serving a community that don't believe in us. Right? Mm. Um, uh, this is when you were telling me how do you address this with your team, this is one of the discussions we have all the time. Is it worth it for what? Um, and in the end, my, 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 always my last answer to that is, look, there's lessons to get from history. And the first one is that this time will pass too. And we want to be here when this is over. We want to keep doing what we do now. And the only way to do that when this is over is to keep doing it now with the same rig rigorous editorial standards because we want to keep it when this is over and not be seen as propagandists of any kind. Um, um, so it's an act of resistance um, uh, that needs to go on until it's over. Right? Um, this has allowed us to think in other ways. Adapting it also makes you very creative. Um, we launched last year the Central American Journalists Network, which has uh, um, as main goals uh, to face the emergency that Central American journalism is going through. For example, the first um, axis of work is uh, mechanisms to get people out in case of emergency. Uh, we have 24 hours to get someone out of one of our countries. We need to establish a system to do that safely. Second, um, uh, a, a system of reception of that journalist. We see ourselves, we learned from the Mexican uh, uh, experience, and one of the biggest dramas in Mexico besides the huge amount of our colleagues that are being killed is one every 15 days on average. But it's also the huge amount of journalists that are in exile now. Some of them end up selling hot dogs in the streets of San Diego. So in practice, we lost a journalist. We can't practice anymore. So we need to develop systems of reception for those journalists that go into exile so they can keep practicing journalism. Um, the third one is support for legal defense. It's very hard financially to keep uh, 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 facing all these legal processes against us. So we need to get some funding and some legal advice and legal support uh, to help them face uh, uh, um, these processes. And the fourth is, of course, um, uh, a joint, a common front in public expressions on defense of our colleagues. So what I tell you is that I don't believe we ever before had a, 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 journal, a, a regional journalism organization in Central America. Now we have it, and this is a, 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 a one of our, our, of our responses uh, after all this reflection about how to answer to what we're going through. Um, I'm very optimistic about this because the good thing is that we are active doing something. Um, I like to insist we are not in a corner scared and crying. We are looking for ways to answer back. Uh, and I think this is going all over the world and I think that's a great story. Um, in Hamburg, uh, when we had this conference last, uh, four years ago, um, Chan Dundar, the Turkish editor, um, had this comment that really stuck with me that, that um, relates to what you were saying. That he said, like, the, these autocrats, they're learning their tools from each other. So we, investigative journalists, we need to learn our tools from each other to fight back against them, you know? The, the, the collaboration that you're talking about uh, is important. Um, Matab, um, Carlos talked a little bit about his relationship with the audience and the, and the difficulties of that. H how do you manage that? I know some of your colleagues are, are working and getting around censorship in Iran. Tell me more about that. So, uh, as much as it's the 
um, you know, like just we have the internet in Iran, we have the censorship in Iran. So they are just uh, blocking in many ways. So most of the media in exile, they're, um, well, if it's like a TV, they are jamming the satellite. If it's a website, they are just uh, blocking the address of the website. So people in Iran should use uh, VPN you know, to access. But the problem is that during the time of the protest, uh, we have a major shutdown. So as we said, you know, like just this, each organization can come up with the initiative. And in Zamane, uh, one of my colleagues find a way that how during the time that there is a shutdown, they can uh, still access the website offline. This is a very interesting plugin in the WordPress, and it's uh, 451. So if you want to know more about that, you can go to 451 tools, uh, and yeah, dot tools, and you know, you can figure out about that. It's just very interesting. So you just need, before the shutdown, just accessing the website once, and during the shutdown, you can still have access to the internet. So saying that, I want to just add something to what Carlos said again about the because you know the, the the topic of living in exile as a journalist is just kind of heavy in many ways. So uh, I'm not the first one in exile. Uh, I have been working and living in exile since 2003. So it's just 20 years. I haven't been home. I haven't seen family. And well, I don't know how sad is that. I don't see any prospect that I can ever go back. And it's not just me, there are lots of people. I have a friend, he's living in Washington City in DC, and he left Iran after the revolution. So it's gonna be 1979. So he has been living in exile for more than four decades. Um, the day before you know, I'm, I have flight here, he called me and you know, his mom passed away. Mm -hmm. He hasn't seen his mom for 40 years. And the day, you know, like just, he was just going, he, he couldn't be there. So whenever one of us, losing a member of family, we all cry together. And it's not victimizing ourselves, it's just like a reality of the life of working in exile. It's with, with us, you know, the melancholy of that. It's just, we have to learn, deal with that and living with that. And I think that's just good to share with other colleagues that don't have this problem. So, you know, it's just very empowering if we know that. So, uh, well, the thing is, uh, I don't know if it's the good news or bad news, I'm not the first one <laughs> from Iran in exile, and I'm not the last one. The first journalist in exile actually was there for the and it was 115 years ago. Uh, so, I'm gonna tell you a very short story. So, in 1908, uh, we had the first constitutional revolution in Iran, and so the king of that time, with the help of Russian, so the story in a very funny way is just repeating. And so he came and arrested some of the journalists in front of the parliament and executed one of the journalists while the king was watching. So what happened, well, the last word was just that, keep the candle light. So another journalist went to Switzerland, and I'm talking about 1908, and it was just one of the first uh, Iranian in exile newspaper. So we have a history of 100 something. Amazing. And then we have different period. We have the revolution. Lots of journalists uh, immigrated or, you know, like just went to exile after that. Then we had the Green Movement in 2009, another group. Then we had the war, Iran Iraq war, another group coming out. And recently, last year, we had the Human Life Freedom Movement, another journalist coming out. I don't think I'm the first one. I'm not going to be the last one, but you know, it's just good to know that you know that's the situation. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, the the length of that history. Um, what you were saying, Carlos, um, and I know Mohammed, you've also talked about keeping the spirit of investigation and of journalism alive, even when you're not sure how long you're going to have to keep that alive in exile. Um, that's an important work, um, and that's an impact that can't be measured in, in numbers, <laughs> and it also sometimes can't be measured in donor cycles, <laughs> yeah. um, but it's a really meaningful... Yeah, um, I just want to add the last thing that, yeah. you know, uh, the only tool that I think that is a secret tool, actually, is the passion that, as a journalist, we have within, our, within ourselves. Mm. So that passion helps us that when a family or friends passed away in Iran, 
when we are seeing all of the brutality and everything, that passion is just a candle inside of us that let us keep going. Passion, That's us too. bravery, well, and creativity. I just have to add something. We are not in a popularity contest. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>